You are listening to the Fresh Take Network. Very grateful uh, to have Lisa Tomitis, the Team Canada and UFA, U of S head coach on the podcast today. Welcome to Fresh Take. Welcome, Lisa. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Josh. So you guys just finished playing the America Cup in Puerto Rico and then suffered a tough loss against Puerto Rico that kept you out of the gold medal game. Uh, lost by three and then advanced the bronze medal game against Brazil, a team that we had beaten earlier in pool play. Uh, it was our second game. We beat them and then uh, ended up losing to them in double overtime. So uh, for sure, in terms of results and, and final placing, we're disappointed. You know, I think those were, were two games we could have and should have won. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, this, this tournament was really a lot about us identifying where we are now and where we need to be for Tokyo. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, we had some good showing early on, like I said, um, shot the ball pretty well. And, and, you know, at the end, just again, it, I think we had, what was it? Seven games in eight days. So it was, a, it's a grueling tournament, you know, it's uh, back to back to back to back games then day off and then, and then three more in a row, but we certainly went into the tournament with the goal of finishing first. Um, we've had some great finishes at the, uh, at some AmeriCups prior to this year and and that was definitely our goal going in and and certainly fell short but um again looking at it from a silver lining kind of perspective in that you know when when we reflect on rio in 2016 and we played in the america cup and we played in the pan am games in 2015 we hadn't lost any games before we went into the olympics and you know, I think in hindsight, that probably wasn't the best thing for us at the time. You know, sometimes you, you learn the most from, well, you do learn yeah. the most from, from losses. Um, so we we're happy we were in some close games and uh, had to go through some time and score situations and see how, how we as a team responded and as a coaching staff and um, certainly have lots to work on and, and lots to improve upon over the next month. But, um, you know, that's kind of where we want to be. We want to identify those gaps and, and, you know, work towards getting those, um, you know, strengthening them now. Well, it was what, 16th month that you had gone without, you know, seeing your girls really at all. And so you kind of just go 16th months and you're just kind of throwing right into this tournament, right? Yeah, it's wild. Um, yeah, when you think back to it being, you know, a year and a quarter, essentially, where we hadn't been face to face, we hadn't been in the same location, we hadn't been on court together. Um, it's a, it's a lot of time. And as much as most of our athletes were competing, you know, whether it be in their pro context or in the NC2A, they're still playing, which was fantastic, but it's very different, you know, when you're not in our environment and, and able to work with them face to face. So uh, we knew that was going to be a challenge coming in. And, um, you know, we had, we did spend a lot of time virtually meeting throughout the course of that year and a bit to stay on the same page as much as you can, but there really is no, um, you you can't replicate the on-court no. connection and, and chemistry that you develop when you're together. So yeah, that's certainly a challenge. But again, um, now that we're together and, and we'll have this extended amount of time together, I think we're, we're going to make up for lost time for sure. What's what's the next step now for you guys? Obviously, you know, before you got on air, you said you're in isolation right now in Tampa. Uh, yeah. Where do you guys go next? Yeah, so we're back here for essentially two weeks. Uh, we'll be we'll take about five days here just to kind of rest and recover and uh, regroup, I guess. And then we'll get back on court and we'll have about 10 days of training. And then we leave for Japan on the 4th of July, wow. um, flying into Korea City. So we'll have a training camp there, at which point partially through we'll get our WNBA players rejoining I was say, us. Key and them come like, like what, like it's like a week or two weeks just before the games that come to yeah. gel with you guys. It's basically a week. Um, yeah. So they'll land, we'll get them up to speed as quickly as we can. We actually have a couple exhibition games lined up against uh, Japan and Australia, sorry, Japan and France. We're hoping to get Australia as well and then head into the village and, and get ready for our first game on the 26th. So it's a, it's a whirlwind for sure, but um you know, a, a great journey that we're on right now. We're so fortunate to be in Tampa. You know, we originally had planned to be in Edmonton for our training, but 
due to COVID and the restrictions for international travel, um, it just made it impossible. So we were very, very lucky that we were able to access the facility down here and um, what the Raptors have been using all during the NBA season. So it's been a phenomenal wow. setup. Yeah. I, I don't envy you at all, Lisa. You know, I got to talk a chance to talk to Air Macalina and Scott Edwards, and they're already dealing with this unbelievable, hectic recruiting classes that you have to deal with right now. But they're not also <laughs> dealing with Team Canada stuff as well. What has the pandemic been like with like a double recruiting class for the U of S coming in and then obviously de dealing and getting ready for the will they won't day with the Olympics as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's been something else. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the whole recruiting process. I mean, especially with us at the U of S, like we rely so much on being able to bring athletes in and see our environment and meet our staff and meet our players and see our practice and uh, sorry, see our practice uh, facility. Um, you know, we really have some great amenities that we can show off. And so to not be able to do that for a year has been really challenging. Um, and on the flip side, you know, not being able to see players in person compete and just watch their progress and get to meet them and get to meet their families and what, you know, kind of what they're all about. It's, it's been really, really difficult. So um, yeah, thankfully we have a great you know, core returning, we were able to secure some quality recruits um, for last year coming in. And um, yeah, we've, we have some good ones coming in, still kind of finalizing our recruiting class for this double recruiting class. It's it's strange, but um, yeah, we're, we're plugging away. It's it's certainly been an interesting time and, and leaning heavily on staff to, to fill the void while I've been gone. It, it's so weird too, because you're going to have some grade 11s that never played grade 12 basketball and they're going to come into a warm welcome into playing in Canada West basketball next year. Yeah, it's it's going to be very interesting to see how that all pans out. Yeah, you know they're they're going to be in a difficult situation, like being out of competitive basketball for over a year, and then to be thrown into the fire, so to speak. So, um, you know, I think a lot of teams are going to be carrying large rosters and and probably looking at some of those first years that have missed out on an entire year as likely a bit of a red shirt season yeah, to get them up say, to speed yeah. i think that's probably you know for a lot of teams that'll probably be the route that that is taken but can't speak for them i, I yeah it'll it'll be interesting to see what happens what what was uh, up until the point of the pandemic where where were you at with canada and with u of s uh like when the pandemic just broke yeah when it broke where were you guys for u of s uh, we had just won a national championship right? Yeah, and literally came back to Saskatoon and a week later, uh, I believe it was about a week later, we were told we had to get out of our facility. They, they were, mm. and, and so they transformed our practice facility, which is uh, adjacent to a, a hockey arena. And they transformed that into um, a COVID, like basically a, um, a field hospital, sorry. And so we had to vacate, we had to move everything out of there, everyone had to come back on campus, we're all masked, we couldn't be, you know, we only could have a few people in there at a time to get stuff out of their lockers. And it was a whirlwind, it was just nuts. And I remember thinking, okay, well, you know, by the spring or by the summer, it's going to pass, we'll get back in here in the fall. And then before we knew it, it was like, there's no way you're getting back in here for at least a year. So that was the case with U of S and, you know, a lot of our players are from out of town. So they took off and wrote their exams at home. And um, many of them, well, most of them made the decision to return back in the fall. And thankfully we were able to do somewhat normal training for September to November. Uh, and then we were shut down again and essentially locked out until, until now. Um, now we're into some small groups, I believe, but nothing contact and, and no five on five. And then from a Team Canada perspective, so we had just qualified for the Olympics in the middle of February. We we're in Belgium. And it's funny, like even at that time for the flight over and the flight back, you know, there was some, hey, do you want to wear a mask? Like that, this is something that's happening in Asia right now. It might be advisable. We should think about it. And it was really optional and, and really not too much talk of it or concern. Um, so just qualified and then boom, you know, a month later, this had happened. So we were in a holding pattern for a little while, but then it was early March where we, you know, start hearing rumblings of Team Canada pulling out of the Olympics if they were going to move forward. So that was the next big grenade that was dropped. 
at the time. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, it was the, the postponement of the game. So we've been on a quite an emotional roller coaster here. Um, and then just kind of had to had to regroup and had to, you know, be creative in our approach and, and what we we're going to do remotely people return to their pro teams in the fall. But again, we missed out on lots of training opportunities that, that other nations were able to capitalize on. They had a, a November feeble window that teams were able to get together for as well as in February, but we weren't able to do either of those. So, um, yeah, we just we had to be creative and, and figure out how we could still continue to grow during this period of time. I was going to ask you when Canada did do the, the pullout of the Olympics and then obviously the games get posed themselves Were you guys kind of led like a little bit privy to, Hey, this is the direction that Canada is going to be making with their Olympic team. You know, I was asked that before and yeah. um, surprisingly, no, I think mm. things just happened so quickly. I was right. literally sitting at home and on social media and something popped up on Twitter. And I was like, what is going on right now? I mean, to be frank, it wasn't that surprising as far as like, no, kind of figured at that point, there was going to be a postponement, but the decision for Canada to, to pull out um, before that announcement, like we weren't given a heads up ahead of time at all. Um, I think some athletes were, but it just, it was, it's too far reaching to try to get a hold of everyone in a timely manner. So unfortunately, a lot of people heard via social media. So that was, that was a bit of a shock at the moment. Um, but then again, quickly moved to the entire thing being postponed. And, and so I think kind of got to a, got to an okay place pretty quickly. And luckily enough, you guys are back right now yeah. in, uh, in action was, uh, was the, the, the FIBA America cup that was planned for last year, right? It just got postponed to this year as well. Um, gosh, no, I think it was, uh, no, it was for, it was for this year. Okay. Um, so sure. it would have been it would have been Tokyo last year, and then it would have been this would have been like the competition for this season essentially, um, leading into the World Cup and qualification for that. So that's right. how this kind of got we got doubled up on. So in a, in a nice way though, it was kind of like a nice kind of refresher for you guys in a way. In a way, it's kind of grateful to have that. Kind of, and you got like the crowd out there. That Puerto Rican crowd I thought was a really you know for as limited as it was, it seemed like a pretty good crowd. It was good, you know, for that, for that game, it was, uh, that was our first taste of like a bit of an environment and a bit of a yeah. hostile environment that we've played in for, you know, over a year. So that was really positive. Like you said, these games really are a gift. Um, we were very fortunate to have them at this point in time. At one point, there was talk of it being held later and after the Olympics. But again, for us, we really need these games now. And so, um, yeah, yeah again, to give us a bit of a benchmark and to evaluate where we're at, it, uh, it really was necessary. I can't imagine if we were going without games up right up until, you know, basically when we get to Japan and then just have a couple games that would not have been good for us. So this was really fortunate in terms of the timing and, and what we're going to be able to do with the information that we, that we gathered from these competitions. Well, yeah, you get some extra repping and watching the games on the zone. I really liked what you guys had going on in the post game. I thought that was, especially down the stretch and in the Puerto Rico game, I thought the post game was definitely a strong suit that you guys had going for you. Yeah, you know, we have some, we have a great mix of skill sets, I think, in the personnel that we have playing down there. Um, yeah. You know, with Kayla, she's more of a traditional sort of back to basket, can score close to the rim, um, can hit the mid range now, good in pick and roll. And then Letitia played uh, and played at the five and she's, you know, more, I guess, new age as far as like can face up, can play off the dribble, has the athleticism, but can also score back to the basket. So she, you know, gives us a bit of a different look. And then with Natalie Achanwa, again, a bit of an undersized post, but it's going to play away from the basket and a great passer. So it can help facilitate um, offense and, and keep things moving that way. So I think we've got a you know, some good looks. And then we have Miranda AM and, and uh, I really Nile liked AM Robert down the stretch England. there. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked her progression of her game and it seemed like the broadcasters were getting high in her as well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just seasoned veterans that can take advantage of, of some matchups down low, but again, can also step out and, and play off the dribble. So yeah, we've been, we've been really happy with, um, you know, where they've taken their game over the course of the last little bit. 
So we saw just before we get on here, Team USA announced their roster officially, and it's it's a very nice roster. But you guys are, you know, you guys aren't any slouch yourself. You're still ranked fourth in the world. Uh, when can we expect the final roster for Team Canada? Uh, it'll probably be early July. Yeah. yeah, probably right before we jump on that plane heading to heading to Japan. So some big decisions still need to be made for sure. We're down to our final sixteen. Um, I mean, this is the the really tough, tough part, right? Because you you probably have, you know, we have, well, we had 20 athletes that we got down to 16. And, and before we got down to 16 of the 20, we said, really, those 20 are um, deserving of being on the Olympic roster. And we're at the point now where some very, very talented, committed, dedicated um, players are getting cut. And um, unfortunately, they're, you know, the... We have to move on and um you know it's a it's a i guess from a program perspective it's a good problem to have and that we have so many quality players now but um you know certainly feel for those that that aren't able to continue on with us because they have committed and they have um, sacrificed a lot to go on this journey up till now i was able to talk to shawnee about this obviously rio was so close to get into the metal side what were some of those things yep. you took from rio and uh, what are the, those things you're installing, you know, for yourself as a coach and for your players going here into Tokyo? Yeah, I mean, goodness, Rio was, each Olympics has been such a different experience, you know, like um, qualifying in 2012 on the last possible day to get to the London Olympics was uh, a thrill because Canada hadn't been at the Olympics for, for 12 years. And yeah. so that was just enormous. And to go and compete and, and compete eat and show well. Um, it was the first time really that our national team, I think, had been on national TV and people were just starting to get to know who this senior national team is. And so everything around sort of the inspiration, I think that that team provided and um, again, the exposure that we had and, and that experience of getting back on the, the big stage of playing at the Olympic Games was massive for women's basketball in Canada. And then um, move forward, and, and now we've got 2015, and we win the Pan Am Games against the USA team. We we qualify, and we win in Edmonton uh, at America Cup, and uh, we were riding a wave. And I think, you know, going prior to both of those competitions, I don't think anyone would have talked about Canada and, you know, their chances of meddling at all. But all of a sudden, there was this wave of, um, you know what, maybe Canada has a chance at winning a medal. And so that started to build heading into Rio. And, um, you know, Kia was um, kind of emerging as sort of the, the face of our team at that point in time. Um, and then we had veterans who this would have been their second uh, second Olympic Games. And so I think the expectations started to rise. And, uh, you know, like you said, we were so close. We, we played a, a France team that we had beaten earlier in the summer. And we're feeling very confident against. We had a lead going into the second half. And unfortunately... Um, relinquished that and ended up losing in the quarterfinal and, and really that disappointment and it, it was more than disappointment I mean it was it was gut-wrenching it was um, probably the worst loss many of us have experienced yeah. knowing that you know we were that close to getting to play for a medal um, I'd say it was it's provided the motivation and drive to make sure that that doesn't happen again and so I think there's this you know, intense, uh, just like drive or, um, yeah, I guess just passion to ensure that we learn those lessons. And, you know, I think there were lots for sure, um, you know, from a coaching staff perspective, um, you know, things that we could have done better and things that we need to do better for, for this journey, for sure. Um, from a systems perspective and, and even just from a team dynamic perspective. So, um, you know, we've addressed a lot of those things over the course of this past quad. And uh, yeah, so we feel like we're in a good place for sure. Um, again, the pandemic kind of put a hold on things because really last February at the qualifier, we were probably playing our best basketball that we have been, you know, over I don't know how many years, you know, we yeah. were, we beat some quality opponents when we needed to, we played Belgium on home soil and beat them. So we were feeling pretty good and, uh, you know, wish we could have just been able to continue that trend on to the Olympics last year. But um, again, there's, there's definitely positives to having had this, this year. 
Um, I think some of our younger players have had the additional time to continue to develop their game for sure. So yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of different dynamics that come into play. You've definitely seen such an evolution. I mean, uh, of the women's game. I mean, you've been at the coach of, of U of S since 1998 uh, yeah. <laughs> and the women's game has just grown so much. And they, you know, like I, I'll say in this over and over again, I think the worst kept secret is that the NCAA women's tournament has been better than the men's for almost five years now. Yeah. And like, I always say, unfortunately, the one that really turned that game one around was to the detriment of Kia, unfortunately. Yes. Um, but what have you kind of noticed about the growth of the women's game? And I, I hate to use this word because it shouldn't have been there, but it's been there now with the added respect to it and uh, just the overall growth for Canada basketball and the women's game overall. Yeah, I mean, it's been phenomenal. Um, just, again, the exposure, um, the TV coverage, the media coverage, I think that really, it starts with that. Um, like you said, you know, it's been best kept secret, I guess. And uh, it's been there, the quality of play, the quality of the athletes, the um, competitiveness of games, it's always been there, but I don't think anyone's seen it. And until you see it, you really can't become a fan of it. And um, so again, I remember 20 years ago being at U of S and the final four coming on, the women's final four coming on and never being able to watch any of the tournament, you know, had to convince a bartender at a Boston pizza to turn one of the 20 TVs in the bar over from NHL hockey to, you know, NCAA women's basketball. But that was the only way that you could even watch a yeah. game. And so to now, fast forward 20 years and to turn on, you know, a major network on TV and see the tournament. Um, it's been phenomenal just how that evolution has occurred. And so, um, yeah, you know, I think Kia has been a big part of that too, just as far as like the game in Canada, you know, when she went to Yukon, then all of a sudden TSN started showing a few Yukon games mm -hmm. and uh, when they were in the tournament. And so, I think that's just continually grown and now she's moved on, but now they're showing, okay, South Carolina on TV because Letitia's there or, um, you know, Arizona because Shana's down there. So, um, and Yukon again, because Aaliyah's there. And so again, the more we get to see it on mainstream TV until we can turn on the TV and see a women's game um, consistently, just like you can see an NBA game or an NC2A men's game, we still have work to do for sure. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's phenomenal to see. I think the next step now has to be the respect for the, for the U-sport women's game, right? And, you know, how can we watch those games and yeah, they're webcasts, but let's, let's get those games on TV. Definitely. Um, I, I don't think anyone will be disappointed watching any one of those games. So the, the talent and the quality of the, of the play is high. And I think it's just like you said, gaining a, a bit of respect for it. As someone that's had a sister that played U-sport for five years, it would have been very nice not to just have the, the stream to go into that. I'm like, Oh, this, the, the U of A is playing U of S in this game or whatever. I mean, I remember the, one of her first games was against, uh, it was in Regina and I think they played you guys. I am pretty sure. Uh, so it would have been nice to have those games at the very least. Right. And I know Tim McAuliffe uh, is a big component of trying to push that. So hopefully more yes. people listen to the Tim McAuliffe's of the world and really push that agenda going forward. Uh, it's, it's really interesting for Team Canada basketball right now. Obviously, the men, they have a big set of games coming down here for the qualifiers. They'll play Greece, which I'm sure is a little bit, you know, you're always going to go for Canada, but you'll always have the, <laughs> the kind of back and forth in your heart. They got lucky because it doesn't look like Giannis will be playing yeah. for Greece. Uh, have you had any conversations with Coach Nurse as they get ready for these qualifiers? Not much, you know, he was uh, really gracious when we got to Tampa, um, he just sent me a text and, and said, you know, if there's anything you need, please let me know. Um, we were hoping to be able to get to watch some of their training sessions after we're out of isolation. But again, with COVID and yeah. just how protective you need to be with your bubble, uh, we're not going to be able to gain any access. So that's unfortunate, you know, being in the same place and not being able to, to do that. But I mean, Nick's been great. I was able to get in and, and watch some of their training um, two years ago when they were getting ready for the World Cup. And uh, yeah, just been fun watching him and the Raptors and then now his involvement, his involvement with Canada basketball, like the guys, um, you know, they're going to they're going to be great. Um, yeah, they they <laughs> I was watching that that net. Nets and Bucks series with um, bated breath, just seeing what's going to happen there and the timing. And if Giannis 
else is going to be able to join them. But now that they've moved on, I mean, great that uh, great for Canada that he's not going to be able to be there. So um, yeah, I think they're going to kill it. It's going to be an amazing competition in Victoria, and I can't wait to watch. It was so funny watching that because you saw Dan Schulman and uh, a few other people being like, "This is I'm rooting for this for Canada because I don't <laughs> want to have them deal with Giannis." So, and I think particularly like I have high hopes. I think that you know we have a chance for the men and the women. Women obviously have a much better chance, but for you both potentially medal and really grow this Canada game. I know a lot of people say, "Oh, the Kawhi shot and the Raptors help," but you know people like you have really helped in growing this game, and I think that would put like such an exclamation part to really get to show a double medal in Tokyo for, for basketball. Yeah. I mean, we're excited at the opportunity for sure. You know, especially with having gone this period of time with, without a lot of sports, I mean, certainly they're yeah. back on now and with the NBA and WNBA, it's been phenomenal just being able to tune into those games on a regular basis. But I think a, a lot of the general public are just like so hungry to watch the Olympics and to see Canadians compete. Um, I think it's a real, you know, feel good story for, for this summer, being able to see these athletes who've persevered through this pandemic and figured out ways to continue to train, to be world-class um, and then to go into such a restrictive environment and, you know, do it for, for their country. I think it's, it's so inspirational. So um, yeah, the opportunity is right there for us for sure. And um, yeah, we're, you know, we've, we know we have some work to put in between now and then, but definitely um you know the, the chance to be at another olympic games is like nothing else so i want to take you back a little bit what was the uh, the first memory that really made you fall in love with this game Ooh. uh great question i don't know i, th I think it was like a slow burn yeah. <laughs> um early on like just played a ton of sports with my brother which with friends you know just you know you had the hoop and the in the in the uh, actually in our cases it was in the backyard we had a patio out back and played a ton of like 21 one-on-one and uh you know I was always kind of the tallest kid in the class and so you, you gravitate towards some sports that you know you're probably going to be better suited towards and and for me I, I was so fortunate we had um well I had a number of female coaches along the way and I think it was it was really them that instilled this you know, sense of passion for the game and, uh, you know, what it can do for you as an individual and as a person, if you, you know, put everything into something that you love. And uh, so for me, I was really fortunate in high school to have some, some great high school coaches, Brenda Nelson and Bev Smith, and then to go to McMaster and to have Teresa Burns as my mentor and, and university coach. I think, you know, without them, I wouldn't be where I am today for sure. And would not have had the love for this game that I do have right now. What was your, what's your playing career? Like, I know you played it in Greece for a bit and I, you know, I should be a better broadcaster, but I cannot pronounce this club's name without butchering it. So. Oh, it's, it's a good one. Patola Maeda was. There you uh, go. I, I could get that, but I need like a task Mellis or someone to, <laughs> you to help me get it pronounced correctly there. But uh, what was your, what was your, it must've been really nice to go and play in Greece. Yeah, you know, it, it was it was a great opportunity for me. I mean, my dad's Greek, um, so my ancestors are from there for sure. My mom's English, or, or you know, ca as Canadian as you come. Yeah. So you know, we we actually, for my brother and I, we really didn't embrace the Greek culture um, a ton because it was just my dad and we were in yeah. you know Dundas Ontario there's no Greek community there um, we had uncles that were in uncles and uh, cousins that were in Toronto but really didn't see them other than the odd special occasion and uh, so that you know we didn't have an appreciation for the Greek culture so then after I played at McMaster and had this opportunity to to play in Greece you know, I didn't speak the language. I didn't understand any of it. Um, so to go and to kind of be in a small town in Greece, which so happened to be close to actually where my dad was born. Oh, wow. Uh, it was awesome. Yeah, it was great. My, my first year, though, I lived with um, an American teammate. And so she wasn't too open to getting to know you know, the, the city or the culture or anything. So we were kind of in this apartment and in our own little world and, and didn't really embrace the Greek teammates and get to know or get to learn any Greek. But in my second year, um, I lived on my own and um, 
definitely made some friends on the team and learned the language, got to understand um, you know, a little bit more about the culture, got to visit my relatives. And uh, so I, I just gained a whole other appreciation for Greek culture and, and for my dad and for my dad's family. Uh, and then from there, you get the U of S job. How did that happen so quickly? Oh, yeah, that was that was a good one. Um, so I ended up getting injured when I was playing and uh, came back after my second year. And at that point in time, I realized, you know, I wasn't go going to be able to play at the level that I knew I needed to be able to play to continue on and, uh, you know, try to advance my playing career. So I was faced with the stark reality of, OK, what next? Um, and I had I had done some coaching and and really my experience in Greece kind of um, solidified the sentiment that, you know, I could probably be a better coach than a player. Um, and also, you know, you learn a lot. You know, I had some great coaches growing up. And then I think in Greece probably realized, you know, you learn a lot from coaches that you probably wouldn't want to replicate as well, you know. So came back and uh, the U of S job came open at that, you know, 20 some odd years ago, you know, university jobs just didn't come up. You know, there were so many coaches that had been at their, you know, schools for 20 years and more. And for me, it wasn't, you know, it was kind of this dream job. Yeah, it would be awesome to be a university coach, but never ever thought it would come to reality because the jobs just don't pop up. But anyway, this job popped up. Um, that specific spring and um, I thought about it but I wasn't going to put my name in and um, you know my, my former coach Teresa and the athletic director at McMaster at the time Tres Quigley really encouraged me to do it and so they convinced me and I kind of threw my name in the hat and on the very last day before the applications were closing and you know kind of one thing led to the next and I ended up getting the job but you know I think at that point in time the the program had you know been terrible to be quite frank they had not won a lot and so I think they were just really looking to mix things up and take a chance on someone completely you know unbeknownst to the community and to the university I didn't have this big coaching resume but I think at that point in time they were just like hey let's just take a chance on someone um, I think my my references got me the job to be honest Trez Quigley is probably the most highly regarded athletic director in Canada and so a reference from her probably went a really long way so yeah, I ended up getting the job at 26, had never been to Saskatoon, um, never been a head coach at university, but had assisted at McMaster for a year and a half. Um, so I took a leap of faith and, and they did as well, certainly. And it was a three-year contract. And I remember thinking, getting on that, that flight to go to Saskatoon in 1998, thinking, well, I'm gonna be back, you know, back in Ontario in three years. I can't imagine this going on for very long. So, so that was, that was how it happened. Multiple coaching of the years, championships later, you're still rocking it there. It's unbelievable, really. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I always look back and go, it's, it was probably a really good thing. I didn't know anyone in Saskatoon. I had zero friends because it was just like all work for the first few years there and really invested in the program, really invested in the athletes there. I was also super fortunate. I mean, I'd landed landed a job with a team that had um, a future national team point guard on it, Jackie Lavallee, a an athlete in Ali Fairbrother who probably could have been on multiple national teams had she really like, um, you know, been driven towards that and had the the guidance. And then several other athletes who, you know, were Can West all-star caliber. And so I was very, very fortunate. I remember getting there and thinking, holy cow, like some of these athletes are better than any athlete I've coached before. Like, what do you do with them? But they were just so, you know, credit to them. They were so keen. They were just like, okay, new coach, just like, tell us what we need to do. Cause we'll, we'll do anything. We're, we're so hungry to be successful. And so I love that. Like I was so drawn to that type of student athlete. And I think it just kind of grew from there. They really you know, laid down the, the foundation and the culture that we've built our success on, which has been just like, you have to outwork people. <laughs> you need to be humble enough to put in the work. And I think that's also resonated with, um, with our community. You know, we've had great uh, support from them. Um, so it's just, again, it's, we've continued to build upon that. So it, it really started in the early days. That's for sure. 
And I mean, look, I definitely, whenever I hear recruiting classes, I always hear U of S come out. You've ever, you've definitely been one of the better recruiters of getting some of the top tier women to your college with, with the growth of Canada though, and women going down to the NCAA, what has that kind of adjustment been like with more women going to the NCAA than doing Canada with like, there's still the nice yeah. balance of it, but obviously now women are like, Oh, well, if I go to NCAA, maybe I have a better chance at the WNBA. Yeah, it's been a it's been a really interesting dynamic. Um, I think every NC2A program is looking for that diamond in the rough. I think they see yeah. Canada as um, you know a, a country that has a ton of talent, and the talent has a ton of character. You know, I think they know that Canadians are going to work hard. They're going to play a role. Um, whatever that role may be. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talent up here. And so there've been increasing, you know, a lot of interest from top level programs coming into Canada. And then, you know, you have the trickle down effect of not just the top level, but every level, whether it be, you know, mid majors or the div twos even. Um, so for Canadians, I think if you want a scholarship, you can find a place in the States. Um, it's just a matter of the fit and what the what the goals are of the individual like for us um the the trouble comes for u sport is that you know the successful u sport programs have all div one talent i think we're at a stage now where most of our roster has turned down nc2a div one offers to play at the u of s like that's the quality of player that we now have to get to be able Definitely. to compete at the highest level and so you have to you have to find the ones that um, you know the, that you offer the program that they want, that they see the value of a Canadian education, that they see the value of staying and playing in Canada and the connections and the community and the still the high level basketball that's being played, and you know for a lot of them I think it's the the opportunity to play for a national championship. I think for the Canadians that go to the NC2A, those opportunities are like, unless you're going to a top 25 school, um, it's it's a really, you're not gonna be playing for a national championship for the most part. Um, but again, it's it's all about the fit of the the goals of the individual and um, and what the what the university or college is providing. So um, yeah, it's um, that that combo is, is the, the tough part to find, you know, the, the ones that are going to excel in the U sport environment and the ones that are going to love that type of experience versus what they could get in the U S. So I just think, um, we have a ton to offer in Canada and there's, there's more and more scholarship support that is available. And I think just the, the next missing link that we have to provide is that exposure, you know, the, um, the coast to coast media attention on on our sport and on our athletes that I think they deserve and uh, not just for the national tournament. Absolutely. I, I mean, in some ways to kind of put a parallel for you, you kind of became the Yukon of Canada for the U of S right? <laughs> basketball excellent really goes. I, I am interested, you know, being from Alberta uh, and watching the game grow and there's been good basketball players out here, but it really seems like a lot of the best ballers come from Ontario and at times Quebec as well. Why do you think that the Ontario, Quebec, a little bit BC, what, what, what do you think Alberta, or I don't know what Alberta or Saskatchewan or Manitoba is missing, but why don't you see as, why don't you think we see as many ballers from those on a national level? Um, you know, I mean, just the population base in Ontario, but also yeah. the um, basketball is the sport to play. And the best athletes in Ontario are playing basketball, in my opinion. Um, you know, again, you have that Raptors effect and you have, um, yeah. you have those athletes who are, who are playing basketball. I think in Alberta on the prairies, it's still, you know, we're Hockey. obviously we have, yeah. you know, what, not even 10% of the population of Ontario, but, um, that our best athletes are split between hockey, volleyball, soccer, and basketball. It, it's not a given that best players or the best athletes are going to play our sport and so it's just I think it's a numbers game for sure and so when you have that exceptional athlete that's coming through um, then they don't have the the competition to continue to push them to greater heights so I think it's coming for sure I think you know we're always going to produce the one-offs here and there um, that have potential to play on national team and and play at the highest level but um, 
you know, I think we still have to provide opportunity and try to get those those athletes loving our sport and, and seeing the benefit of it and how fun it is to play. And then, you know, just again, continuing to, to grow the base. So the product at, uh, you know, in high school is better. And then the product going on to university is, is that much higher. I definitely think you're right. You definitely have seen the growth. I think the Raptors effects helps. And I think, you know, what you guys are potentially going to do in this Olympics is going to help speaking about Olympics. So 2012, I believe is when, you know, the job comes to you, obviously, you know, kind of a, a dream come true. What was that, uh, what was that dialogue like and leading up to that? Yeah. So, um, 2012 went to the London Olympics as an assistant coach, um, working with Alison McNeil as the head coach and, and her husband, Mike, as another assistant. And yeah. so, it was late 2012 that um, Allison decided that she had she was going to retire and, and be done. And so then it was, yeah, the, the, the next decision. It was very similar to my decision to, to put my name forth for the U.S. job in that, um, you know, was I going to do it and was I going to put my name forward? And, you know, a lot, a lot of thinking about that. And am I ready for it? Can I do a good job of it? You know, in my opinion, working with a coach and Allison who was just the best, right? And <laughs> knowing I'm not the same type of coach as that she is. And so just, again, a lot of, I think, reservation and hesitation around it. Um, but at the end of the day, decided that if I didn't, I would have regrets. So yeah. put my name forward. And, um, you know, after a, a lot of conversation and interview process and, you um, contemplation, I'm sure, from um, Canada basketball side, uh, we decided to do this. And, um, you know, it was the best decision I ever made was, was to put my name forward. It's been a phenomenal ride. We saw success early on, for sure. You know, at that point in time, I think the, the team was ranked about 11th in the world. And, uh, you know, went on and 2014 World Championships were upon us right away. And we had a fifth place finish, which was the best finish in, I mean, I think it was about 30 years at that point in time since 1986. And that really, um, I think, put a mark on the on the international basketball community that Canada was coming. And uh, so we kind of had that that rise and it built towards 2016. And, uh, you know, now we're just continuing to, to work towards making that next step. I think we really made a, a great climb in those first few years and got to a point where, hey, we, we deserve to be in the quarterfinals now. We deserve to be talked about um, from a sense of, you know, a top seven five team in the world and now we're we're working hard to to get to that podium finish and that's the next step for us and that's i'm sure a lot of canadians are, are hoping for last few questions here and again thanks so much for your time for sure. uh how, how would you describe your coaching style uh, um i'd say pretty demanding um i'm i'm tough to please on the court but uh for me, it's only, and I, I'm, I have high expectations because I, I believe in these athletes and, and what they can do. And I think they need to be pushed. I, I think if you set the bar high, people will live up to it. Um, so that's, you know, it's a, it's a good thing, but it's also something that I have to work hard towards being more positive and, and um, you know, helping them along the way, as opposed to being critical and, and tough to please. But at the same time, I think I'm fair. I think I'm well-prepared. Um, we'll do anything for, for our athletes, for sure, in terms of loyalty, in terms of helping them, you know, progress and grow and, and move forward along this journey. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm pretty serious, but I think I, I'd love to have fun. We just don't, I don't think our, our athletes get to see that much from me because you're always in such a high pressure situation. You're always trying to yeah. prepare. And, and for me, um, it, it's really all about the work behind the scenes that you do to, to help prepare your team as best you can um, for their best performance on the biggest stage. And so that's really where, where I put my efforts um, to make sure that we leave no stone unturned and, and we're, we're ready. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, the NCAA looking for those diamond in the roughs, but, you know, like I said, you do such a good job at Canada West and there's great talent in Canada West. Has there been, you know, WNBA scouts or, you know, conversation about WNBA players coming up to the U of S to look at some of the players to potentially draft them out of there? Um, not yet. I think there's just so much talent in the, the NC2A. It's yeah. just, um, you know, it's, a, a, a there's so many players down there and, 
Um, I think the WNBA is now highly regarded as probably the toughest professional league to crack a roster. You know, there's only 144 so spots. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. We have the number of Canadians in the league as we do uh, because it, uh, it is such a competitive league to get on a roster. And even when you get on a roster, there's no guarantee you're going to be on it for long term. You know, you're, there's constantly influx of talent every year trying to fight for a spot. And so, um, yeah, I think um, it'll be great when the day comes that we have a, a player that was, well, I, you know, you could look at Niall Renkakakunwe as, as someone who played for a Canadian team who's in the WNBA, um, you know, right. certainly playing at Simon Fraser, that's just, it's massive. I don't think there's enough said about her and, and her journey and, you know, where she's taken her game and that she's playing on the biggest, in the biggest We stage. could go like three hours with all the cool stories from your players that I have done research on. There's so many cool stories yeah, yeah, about yeah. this team so, and the journey that they've made. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, so I, I guess I just end this and just saying like best of luck in Tokyo. Uh, obviously the country's rooting for you. I'm, I'm rooting for you guys hard. I've been such a component of, you know, wanting this women's game to get to this next level for respect that, you know, it should have had long ago, but, uh, I'm looking forward to having those games on CBC and, uh, hopefully yeah, that you guys great. can, uh, take it to that next level and get that medal, especially for you to add to, uh, Add to your trophy case. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I really appreciate the time here and uh, the opportunity to share some of our stories. For sure. All right, everyone. Until next time, cheers. Enjoy.